tell me about uh, Time GPT and the recent developments there. Yes, Time GPT. So, <laughs> Time GPT came out October 2023. That's when the um, the paper was published. Um, and um, really great team behind Time GPT. So it's uh, it's Nix Club that is behind them. Uh, they're really great. So I, I've used their, their libraries. Uh, I believe they're making one of the best forecasting libraries, open source forecasting libraries out there. Um, really, you know, implementing ready to use state of the art models. Uh, they're great. I've met with them, they're like amazing team. Um, and, and they came out with Time GPT. So, Time GPT, uh, a generative pre trained model, right, uh, for time series forecasting. So, essentially, take what Chat GPT does for language and Time GPT does it for time series forecasting, right? Um, and that's a huge shift in paradigm for the field, okay? Like we are used to fit our model on past data to forecast the future, and our model works only for that specific time series, right? Makes sense. Um, and what, what they're saying now is that, no, you can pre-train this model on a bunch of data, right? So on a, like, if I remember well, like 3 billion data points different data sets, okay? So like economics, financial uh, data, weather, you know, uh, traveling data, like a bunch of different fields, right? So they trained on all of that. It's Again, it's the transformer architecture, right? So it's still the encoder and decoder uh, structure that we see to to generate the prediction. Um, but, but yeah, but, but it's, a, it's adapted for time series forecasting. And so in their paper, Again, they claim state-of-the-art results, okay? So compared to other methods, so and here they compare to transformer methods and also to some uh, MLP architectures. Um, so it's uh, it's huge, uh, I would say. Uh, it's not available to everyone yet, okay? So right now it's in closed beta. Uh, I had the chance to test it. Um, <laughs> it got scary because it, it actually worked better than my model. Uh, you know, for, for a particular situation, okay, so it actually worked better. So it made better forecasts. Um, in another situation, so what, what I've noticed is that as you go for more long-term forecasting, you're actually reaching some of its limits, and then the, the predictions actually start to deteriorate pretty fast. So for long-term forecasting, uh, models like NHIS and stuff like that still work better than Time GPT. But for, you know, short to medium term, uh, it, it actually worked really well. And and keep in mind that the idea is the model is pre-trained, right? So you, all you have to do is send your data through an API, you make an API call, and like in, in a few seconds, I mean, in less than a second, right? You're getting predictions back. And it also abstracts all this need or like expertise, you know, that you need for time series forecasting, right? Um, so, so, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, I'm not sure it's going to remove the need, you know, for professional forecasters and, you know, having this uh, domain expertise, right? Um, but but it is interesting as a solution, you know, for people who just need, you know, maybe they don't have the means to have a data scientist or just need some quick forecasting, you know, um, it, I think it's going to be pretty cool for them. Yep. Yeah, it's fascinating that, like, previously, you might only use one specific data point, data set, and, but now we, we can actually combine lots of different data input points and then predict many different kinds of series. And yep. I mean, it's strange. You'd, you'd think that like individual models would be better individually and maybe they still are, but like, yep. what are the problems with trying to predict multiple different series with one, one model? Well, uh, again, like uh, I really believe there is no, you know, there's no one solution to all problems, right? So to me, I still see Time GPT as another way of solving a problem, okay? Um, and so, I mean, for, for sure the model can only, the model can only know what it trained on, right? Um, and, and the idea of those very large models, right, is that you've trained it on so many things that it is likely going to, you know, some kind of some, you know, in a way, recognize what is happening and make some reasonable predictions. Okay, so that was the idea behind the three billion data points on a on data sets from various industries and domains, right? That's the idea. Um, so, so yeah, but I mean, for sure, if you bring it, you know, something totally unexpected, right? It has never seen before. Mm -hmm. 
well, chances are it's gonna it's gonna fail, right? And and that's okay. That's expected, right? Right. So it's still not designed to you know take in data about basketball and baseball and football and then give you you know cricket is, or, or will it? You know, is it possible that it could also maybe predict another sport based well, on predictions of others? Yes, maybe, maybe it could, right? But but again, it's uh, like I said, we always have we always have to test it against something else, right? And that's that's really important. So for anyone, you know, I myself, I'm a data scientist. So anyone doing forecasting, doing data science, it's important to keep that rigor in our work. You know, we're we're scientists, right? Like we we need to, we're always analyzing performance against something else. And so never never take something at face value, right? So sure, test out time GPT, but test it against something else, right? Test it against your own custom model that you're inputting, you know, your historical data, and then you have your exogenous variables and whatever, and see is it actually performing better or not? And that's when, you know, base your decision on that, essentially.